Jesus glad and the devil mad. Amen. Let's rejoice. Get your Bibles out and do the same. Let's get into the Word together. And then let the Holy Ghost do whatever He wants. Let's say this together. Say, Heavenly Father, I do desire more of You, more of Your Spirit, but also I need more of Your Word. I'm a Word of God person. I believe what the Word says. The Word says it. I believe it. That settles it. And Father, we thank You for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at Matthew chapter 14 today. Praise God. We'll start reading with verse uh, 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. That's right after the miracle of the five loaves and fishes. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, that's between the hours of 3 and 6 a.m., in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them and saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Everybody say, Peter walked on the water. Yeah, sometimes we forget that part. Everybody say, Peter walked on the water. But when he saw the wind boisterous, now, how many of you know you can't see wind? He saw what the wind was doing, so the waves were beating up against him. Rough out there. He saw the wind boisterous. He was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. How many of you ever cried that? Lord, save me. <laughs> it's a short but powerful prayer. And immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. And said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. And they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. So today I want to uh, just teach you a simple kind of a Thanksgiving message. Defrost your faith. Defrost your faith. How is your faith? Is your faith hot and ready to seize upon the opportunity? Or is it just frozen and immovable? Kind of reminds me of the young bride who was cooking her first Thanksgiving meal. And the in-laws have been invited over. And of course, she's feeling the pressure. She's going to have to, you know, she's got to please her mother-in-law. And her mother-in-law is a really good cook. And she's kind of a, you know, a newbie. And, uh, you know, she's followed all the directions in the joy of cook, cooking cookbook, the one that's about that thick. And, uh, but, you know, the turkey's just not defrosted. I mean, it's, it takes days to defrost one of those things. You know, it's a 36-pound turkey, enough for the whole group, you know. Cost her $250 this year. And... Uh, Inflation has hit the turkey world. And so she just threw it in the oven. She said, it's all going to work out. I'm going to cook it. I'll watch it real close. And then a couple of three hours into it, she starts smelling something. And, you know, she forgot to pull the plastic bag out with a gizzard. You know, that's a kind of a bad way to start things off with your in-laws. But anyway, I mean, how about your faith? Is it, is it frozen and immovable? Or is it ready to seize the opportunity in front of you? Amen. Amen. We need to have our faith hot and ready. Yeah. 
Here in Matthew, we see that Jesus, right after the loaves and fishes, in another gospel, it says, let us pass over to the other side. He made it very clear. He didn't say, let us go out in the middle of the lake and sink, go out there and struggle. He, he gave them authority to get across the lake. And they had given him, he had given them authority to feed the multitude. You know, there's 5,000 men there and women and children besides. So that's 20,000. I, I think it's 20,000 people. You can argue with me. I believe it's at least 20,000 people that were there to eat. Lord, what are we going to do? What are we going to We don't have enough food. Give ye them to eat. See, he gave them authority. He had given them in Matthew chapter 10 authority over demons and disease and they went out by two and two, and they had no problem. They cast out devils. They healed the sick. They came back and said, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us in thy name. That wasn't temporary. He said, now, you know, I'm going to give you this authority, but it's going to expire on the 31st. No, he didn't give them an expiration date. They had authority. And they had authority again to feed the 5,000. They didn't do it. They made him do it. And he showed them how to do it. And then he gets out there. They have authority to get to the other side of the lake. And they're out there struggling and messing around, rowing into the wind, not making any progress. Three o'clock in the morning. I, let's just think about how long it had been. It doesn't say when he, told, when he sent them out there, but it was, it was still daylight. So let's just say it was 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock in the morning, they're still out there. Man, they hadn't made any progress at all. I've been there. It's not a very big lake. Not that big. You'd be shocked. You think about a big sea, the sea of God. This little old thing, man. I think Lake Conroe's bigger than that. <laughs> Are you all with me now? Hadn't made any progress. And so how they're struggling, contrary wind. And you see, I want you to see this now. God told me years ago, teach what you take for granted. You've heard this before. We'll hear it again. We all need to be stirred up in our faith. God delivered me from the fear of repetition. I don't mind preaching something more than once. But God gave me this unique take on this testimony. Years ago, I preached it over and over again. I get blessed every time I hear myself preaching. So if you're not thrilled, I'm thrilled. Praise God. So it says, you know, the boat is a type of the status quo. Think about the boat now. They're in the boat. They're afraid. These are, most of them are fishermen. At least five or six of them are fishermen. I mean, this ain't their first rodeo. They've been out there on that lake. They know what it's like when the wind kicks up and the waves kick up. I mean, it's big enough to have some pretty big waves. And, uh, and so they, uh, they're afraid. And then they're afraid of Jesus. They didn't even recognize Jesus. They just blew their mind. Here he comes walking on the water. <laughs> they had more faith in ghosts than they did Jesus. It's a spirit. So they're locked up in that boat, and the boat is the status quo. The boat is a, safer than it is out there in the water. It's the status, everybody say the status quo. The status quo. You know, they're, they're locked in that boat, and as long as they're in the boat, they're semi-safe. I mean, at least they're not sinking yet. And uh, they, 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 you know, and everything out there is fearsome, you know. But here in the boat, the comfort zone, I want you to see that. Everybody say comfort zone. I mean, the wind and the water is the type of the unknown, the danger, of the impossibility. What can we do? We've been toiling all night long. We hadn't made any problem. What are we going to do? We're just going to have to wait it out until the, until the storm passes, until the wind kicks down, and then maybe we can make it. We're just going to stick here in the boat. We're just, we'll just, you know, I know he said to get over there before him, but he's not going to get there any quicker. Boy, he made a fool out of them because he's walking it. He, he, he's walking faster than they're rowing. And they're even frightened of Jesus. You see the fear there. You see the atmosphere. But then Peter. You know, Peter gets a bum rap. You know, he, oh, ye of little faith. Well, you know what? Little faith walked on the water. He gets a bum rap, I think. 
I mean, he's one out of 12. I mean, 12 of them are in the same situation, but one of them, Peter, looks out there and says, uh, wait a minute now. That might be Jesus. Jesus, if it be thou. Jesus said, it's me. He said, if it be thou. <laughs> it's so funny. Jesus said it was him. I mean, who else would say that he Jesus and walking on the water? Anyway, he said, Jesus, if it be thou, bid me come to thee on the water. You see, Peter Instead of being intimidated, he was thrilled. He was thrilled with Jesus walking on the water. He was thrilled with the Word. You get that now? He was thrilled with the Word. You know what? When you get thrilled with the Word, it'll work for you. When you get thrilled in him and impressed with what the Word says above what's going on around you, the contrary. You got some contrary winds that you're fighting? Listen, I'm telling you right now, when you get thrilled with the Word, it starts working. All 12 of these now are spiritually dead men. They're not filled with the Holy Ghost. They do not have the Holy Spirit on the inside of them. They've received an anointing to heal the sick. They've been given some authority but it's all Old Testament. They don't, they're not like you and I. They've not been born again because Jesus hadn't been to the cross yet. So they don't have the Spirit of God inside of them, informing them. But here, all 12 of them, only one of them was thrilled with the Word. And, and, and Jesus, when Jesus said, come, he didn't say, Peter, come. He just said, come. Now, they could have all had an attitude adjustment suddenly there when they figured out, now, that's Jesus out there, and he's walking. But only one went over the side. I think all 12 could have gone over the side. I said they all 12 could have gone over the side. What if there was anybody else that heard him on the lake? Maybe down the way there. Maybe his voice carried or something. They could have walked on. Come meant to every, anybody who heard that word, it meant that they could come to him on the water. Are y'all with me now? So he had one of them that opened the door and with a, unlocked the door and everybody else could have come and followed him out there. And none of them did. They just sat there like a bunch of frozen turkeys. He's the only one with any faith that's been defrosted. He's the only one that's thrilled with the world. Are y'all getting this now? I'm talking about defrost your faith. I mean, look, we need to make sure we are, our faith is defrosted. And let's pull the plastic bag with the gizzards out of there. And any other kind of junk that might be in there. Amen. I don't even cut the neck up. I throw the neck away. I'm sorry I do that. My grandmother probably twirls around in her grave when she... She never wasted anything. She ate all of it. So only Peter. See, Peter did not agonize, rationalize, you know, analyze. He just went right over the, you know, he's kind of a plunger. Peter the plunger. I'm kind of like that. Not a toilet plunger, but, you know, I tend to just jump before I really look at everything. That's really faith. Faith is like that. Faith is, a, faith is a jump. Faith is a leap. Sometimes we, we spend too much time thinking. We spend too much time cogitating and figuring out reasons why we shouldn't do something. When the Holy Ghost in us is saying, go, jump over the side. Get out there on the water. Hallelujah. You get anything out of this today? So as soon as he went over the side, I mean, his faith, empowered him to violate all the rules of physics. You know, naval engineering, they calculate what, what it takes for something to float. These big old ships, they battleships or aircraft carriers. I mean, they, they're, it's, it's designed to displace a certain tonnage of water. And if it doesn't displace more water than the weight of the ship, what happens to the ship? Well, it blub, 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 it goes under. So they got to make sure. So they calculate the volume of, of, of that ship and how far, how much it weighs and how far it's going to go down into the water. And they calculate how much, the weight of the water that it, that it takes up. And that is what the force is that holds it up. It's a real complicated deal. And uh, 
How can a man walk on the water? Well, you can. You're going to sink. You're at least going to sink down to your neck and then possibly all the way down. I mean, some people don't even ever come up. They dive in and never come up. Some people don't. But he kept on the surface of the water and walked on it. How was that happen? His faith gave him the power to do what Jesus was doing. And Jesus' word gave him the permission. All we need is a word from God. I said all we need is one word from God. And then we believe that word in our heart. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands right now. What a, what a bargain we have as believers. Hallelujah. The word is the answer to your struggle. Your faith is the remedy to your contrary winds, which is why I preach a lot on faith, because we all are going through contrary circumstances. I said we all go through contrary circumstances. I used to think if I could get enough faith, I could avoid the struggle. I, I was just, you know, dumb and just starting out in this. And I thought, you know, I'm going to get my faith. I won't have any trouble. Well, that's the opposite. The devil will always contest you. He will always oppose faith. Paul said, there's a great door and effectual open unto me, but there are many adversaries. You know, he, he found out. Jesus uh, told Ananias, you know, when he said, go, go lay your hands on Peter and get, recover his sight. And he said, I'm going to tell him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. You're not going to go through this life unscathed. You're not going to go through this life without any trouble. Jesus said, in the world, you shall have tribulation, anguish, trouble, resistance. But be of good courage. I've overcome the world. And the implication is you can too. See, your faith is not about avoiding the trouble. It's about overcoming it. It's about going through things and not staying there. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So de defrost your faith. I got three things here to remind you of in case you've let them slip. And uh, it's, you know, it's fresh. Even though I've preached it before, but it's fresh for you. It's Thanksgiving. You need a banquet ahead of the banquet. All right. Number one, defrost your prayer life. Notice Jesus went to pray. I mean, he prayed. He didn't just, just do all these things all the time and all these miracles, raise the dead, heal the leper, open blind. He prayed. He took the opportunity out after a long day of teaching, preaching, and healing, and then feeding. I mean, he did all, man, he worked all day long till almost dark. And he sent them away so he could go away and, and, and send the rest of them away. And then he went up and prayed. Yeah. And now he's walking, walking on the water. I mean, he's put, in a lot, he put in a lot of time. Defrost your prayer life. Prayer's not a monologue, it's a dialogue. Prayer. And pray much in other tongues. We just had an altar call recently. A number of you came up and got filled with the Holy Ghost. Some of you, you had, had some beginning words, baby words, and you hadn't really grown in your language. Some of you came up and got free. You got your tongue freed up where you can pray. Well, pray much in other tongues. I mean, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 uh, that when you pray in tongues, your spirit prayeth. It's your spirit is engaged with God. You may not understand everything, but boy, I'm telling you, when you pray, it also says in verse 4 that you edify yourself. It's similar to charging a battery. You can tell even though that Peter was an Old Testament man, his battery was charged, man. I mean, when he had the opportunity, he asked for the opportunity, and when he was given that opportunity, he walked on the water. What are we doing with our opportunities? What are we doing with our prayer life? What are we doing with the instructions that we've received? Well, you know, pastor been praying a long time. I've never had him talk to me. Well, you know, he just gives you, he gives you impressions. He, get, he, he can communicate a lot of ways. You know, he used to talk to me when I was a baby Christian. I hear his voice all the time, but that quit. I stopped. Why? Because he expects me to walk by faith. He's already spoken to me right here. I've got enough information if I do everything that's in here. I mean, he doesn't really have to do a lot of talking. But at period, in periods of time, he did speak to me. One day he said, regional center. He spoke to me about this church. It's a regional center. 
He spoke to me another time. He said, I want you to wake up the church. And man, did I not understand that. It's becoming more and more clear every day. <laughs> You've got some of the churches asleep and some of the churches really just dead. The Holy Ghost already left. There's no point in messing with them. It's too late. I don't know how to tell the difference, so I have the same message to both. Amen. You know, maybe, maybe we can strengthen the things that remain. Amen. Maybe not every member of a dead church is dead. Maybe some of them are hanging on and God has mercy. I tell you, God's not looking to hurt people. He, he's doing everything he can to fulfill his covenant. Are you with me now? Yeah. Defrost your prayer life. Look to the inside for answers. Look to your spirit. Faith is a spirit, spiritual force. It's in the spirit. It's where you can't see. You know, if you can see it with your eyes, you don't need faith. Faith is what accesses everything that's invisible, but is revealed in the word. Are you with me now? Be still and know that I am God, he says. I, sometimes you just, you get a lot out of prayer by just being still and, and waiting before him. We've kind of lost that. There have been times, none recently that I can remember, but there have been times we'd have a big crowd and a holy hush would fall. And I mean, you got babies, you got children, you got all these adults, and in a crowd this big, it's bound to be somebody that coughs, bound to be somebody that sniffles. I mean, it was complete silence. I call it a holy hush. Amen. And, uh, you know, out of those, it's just so powerful. He's, you know, if you've ever had a dog and your, your hand is just kind of hanging off of your edge of your chair and your dog comes up, starts licking your fingers, do you ignore? No, you, you reach down and you pet him. You, you love on that dog because he's licking. Well, that's what worship is. Worship is when we lick the hand of God. You know what? He's going to pet us. He's going to love us back. That holy hush is just, he, he just envelops you supernaturally with his love. Are you with me then? Oh, you've got to supercharge and defrost your prayer life and spend a little time with him. Besides just driving down the road and praying. I mean, that's good to do that, but I mean, we need to do something besides that. Amen. You know, stir yourself up to hear God say come or go or do this or do that. Stir yourself up to hear. You know, if you don't hear anything, say, Lord, I don't know what it is you want me to do, but just send me. I'm, I'm ready to go. I, my faith is ready to go. It's defrosted. I'm ready to say, you, you just jump and I'll, I won't even ask you how high. Are y'all with me now? Yeah. Number two, defrost your attitude. Defrost your attitude. And I think I go back to the 11. Look at their attitude. Their attitude was, I'm going to stay in the comfort zone. I'm going to stay in the boat. There's Peter. God, let's watch this. This ought to be really good. This ought to be good, man. See, uh, yeah, attitude of just being on the sidelines, being an observer, being in the grandstands, being a Monday morning quarterback. That's the church has no shortage of Monday morning pastors that think they could pastor better, think they could preach better, think they could teach better. They, they have this attitude that they, that they know it all. Boy, if people are just listening to me, you know what? You're, you need to adjust your attitude. You need to defrost it. <laughs> now, what was the boat again? Status quo. Status quo. Some of you were listening. Some of you went to sleep. <laughs> the boat is what? The status quo. So hate the status quo. You've got to hate the status quo. Peter did. Peter did not go with the 11. He jumped out of the boat. Why? Because he was thrilled with the word. He wanted to do what the word was doing. Are you with me? He wanted to be involved. Didn't want to just Monday morning quarterback it. Amen. Defrost your attitude. I like what Smith Wigglesworth said. He said, if I can make a person righteously in a sick person, if I can make a sick person righteously indignant, yes. I can help them. Yes. So along about Tuesday, 
I started getting righteously indignant on something that was coming on my body. And I started breaking out with this stuff. And then Wednesday, it got worse. We had staff pictures, Christmas pictures that we came to, and I wasn't feeling that great. And Thursday, it was a lot worse. Boy, Friday, I had to go to the doctor. But I was righteously indignant. How dare you, devil, try to put shingles on me? I'm not accepting shingles. Well, do you have them? Well, you know, they say I have them, but I don't accept it. I'm righteously indignant. He doesn't have the right to put that on me. How dare you? Now, yesterday, I just had to go around the house without a shirt on. I mean, that, that was pretty ridiculous. I've never done that. I don't do that. You know, I don't go around without a shirt on, you know. But anything on me just hurt. It just hurt. You can't get comfortable. You can't, you know, but praise God. It's on the run now. Why? Because I was indignant and I didn't accept it. I demanded, I demanded it go. See, you, you can't be neutral about sickness. You can't just act like it's, you know, Jesus, he, uh, they told him about Peter's mother-in-law and uh, <clears throat> in uh, Luke 4, 39, you can look it up for yourself, but told him that Peter's, Peter's mother-in-law was, had a fever. And the Bible says that Jesus rebuked the fever and it left. The word rebuke means to chastise. It means to straightly and sternly charge. So in other words, it's like he's talking to an entity and not very kindly. He's not begging. He's not asking. He's demanding. You foul fever from hell, get out of her. See, that's kind of the way I was speaking to the, whatever this was. They said it was shingles. I'm just saying whatever, the, whatever it was. I have some medication, an antiviral. You know, chicken pox. I had chicken pox when I was a kid. So if you've got chicken pox, you've got that virus, it stays in your body. I don't like that, but that's what the medical science says. And then sometimes it can pop out on your nerves and travel around half your body and all that. So it, evidently it must have done that, but I didn't let it and I didn't keep up with, I mean, I didn't permit it. I demanded it leave and it's leaving. Now I got a shirt and a tie on. I'm preaching. I feel just great. Amen. I was laughing with the worship team before the service. I said, well, this kind of adds it all up. I preach with the mumps. I preach with shingles. I preach with angina. I preach with heart failure. I preach with just about every, everything you can think of. It doesn't keep me down. I'm not, if it's time to preach, it's ready for me to jump out of the boat. My faith is hot and ready to be used. Glory to God. Defrost your attitude. You got to hate pain. You got to hate disease. You got to hate poverty and lack. You got to hate. You listen, listen, good is the enemy of best. Well, you know, I can live with this little it's, pain. is no big deal. I can live. No, don't live with it. Stop living with little things. Stop living with just barely able to get your bills paid. Stop living with it. Don't allow it. Don't let the attitude be in you that just lets what Jesus' blood purchased not be claimed in full. Are you with me now? Good is the enemy of best. What did John, what did John 10, 10, Jesus said, you know, I, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. Super abundant in quantity, superior in quality. That's my, that's my gauge. If something's not those two things, then I'm not satisfied. I'm going to, does that mean I'm not content that I'm mad? No, it means that I'm not going to settle. I'm not going to settle. I'm not going to sit in the boat and be an observer to others who are enjoying the fullness of their covenant. Are you with me now? And wishing I was them. No, I don't wish I was them. Praise God. I'm, I'm just doing what, what I'm supposed to do. So defrost your prayer life, defrost your attitude. And the last one is defrost your inaction. Because James 2.20 says, faith without corresponding action is dead. 
You know, faith isn't just a thought. It's not just thinking. It's not just reading in the Bible and being happy. Oh, this is wonderful. You've got to act like it's true. It requires an action. And of course, the initial action is speaking it. But beyond speaking it, it does require us to act. It requires us. I mean, you know, think about that woman that uh, her pastor uh, came to her every day. She was bed fast and been there for two or three years. And he would go by her house and read her scriptures and pray for her. And she'd feel a little better. And then as soon as he'd leave, she felt worse, felt worse. And uh, he was talking to Brother Hagin about it. And the Holy Ghost said, uh, she doesn't have any faith. If she had any faith, she'd get up. She never gets up. So uh, he said, I don't really know what to tell her. And the Holy Ghost had told Brother Hagin, he says, tell her the next time after you go through all of that. And she says, I believe that. Tell her, no, you don't. Because if you believed it, you'd get up and get dressed and cook dinner for your husband. So, <laughs> I mean, three years have been bed fast. Same old thing, every day, every day, every day. I have to eat the pastor's time. I mean, how much time is he spending on one person? Not that she's not worth it, but come on. Over and over. I mean, that's insanity to keep doing the same thing over and over and not get any results. The word brings results if it's believed and acted on. What was, what was missing in this woman? Acting. She agreed mentally. That's all it was. And that won't get you healed. That will not bring you healing. So the next time he went through and read the scriptures, prayed for her. She said, I believe I'm healed. He said, no, you don't. <laughs> what? No, you don't. If you believed you were healed, you'd get up out of bed and get dressed and cook dinner for your husband. Well, I'll show you. And she got mad, see. She got righteously indignant. <laughs> Sometimes you got to ruffle a few, got to break a few eggs. You got to ruffle a few feathers to get people to get what belongs to them. Amen. <laughs> and I mean to tell you, she got up, she got dressed, she cooked dinner. And, she, and that night was Wednesday night church. She showed up and testified in the church that night. Oh, come on. Let's lift our hands right now. She defrosted her inaction. <laughs> Oh, uh, I tell you, Peter jumped overboard because his faith was fully defrosted. So keep on acting on the word. Keep acting like the Bible is true until it is. You know, refuse to be a frozen turkey. Defrost your faith. Come on, lift your hands and receive today. Hallelujah. Everybody say, I'm defrosting my faith. It's hot and ready to be used. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.